सरकार की ओर से मैं हमारे आज के जो मुख्य अतिथि हैं प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जी रविंद्र कुमार जी का हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं सर जैसा कि आप जानते हैं कि इस संस्थान ने 25 साल पूरे कर लिए हैं और इन 25 साल के अंदर हमने बहुत कुछ अचीव किया मैं डॉक्टर नवीन सिंगल आपके समक्ष खड़ा हूं कि पहले दिन से डॉक्टर भटनाकर यहां बैठे हुए हैं मिस्टर राजन यहां पर हैं जो पहले दिन से इस संस्थान से जुड़े हैं और हमारे जो विजनरी फाउंडर लेट श्री नवीन अग्रवाल जी का एक सपना अभी दो दिन पहले जो हमारे पहले कॉन्ट्रैक्टर थे मुंशी जी उनसे मैं बात कर रहा था कि मुंशी जी आप ये बताइए कि आपने पहली ईट इस विश्वविद्यालय की कब लगाई थी तो उन्होंने बताया कि सिंगल साहब इतने दिन बाद आपको मेरी याद आई मैं तो बहुत बुढ़ा हो चुका हूं मैंने नहीं आपको ये तो याद होगा मुंशी जी कि पहली ईट कब लगाई तो उन्होंने मुझे बताया कि जहां तक मुझे याद है नवीन जी ने 4 अप्रैल उन्नीस सौ अट्ठानवे को हमने पहला जो भूमि पूजन किया था जैसे ही उन्होंने मुझे सूचना दी तो मैं आपके तो मुझे बड़ा अच्छा लगा तो मैंने कहा कि सर मैं मुंशी जी मुंशी जी मुझे मैं भी मुंशी जी बोलता था और मेरे को वो सिंगर साहब बोलते थे तो बड़ा फ्रेंडली था उनके साथ डिसीजन तो आज हमारे बीच वो नहीं है नवीन अग्रवाल जी लेकिन वो विजनरी लीडर जो पूरे उत्तराखंड को एक नया आयाम दिया जिसने तकनीकी शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में एक नई बुलंदियां डीआईटी विश्वविद्यालय देहरादून इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी के नाम से 1998 में पहला संस्थान था जिसने अपने यहां चार ब्रांच का शुभारंभ किया 1998 में कंप्यूटर साइंस इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स एंड इलेक्ट्रिकल एम आई राइट सर भटनागर सर चार ही ब्रांच थी तो ये और 182 स्टूडेंट पहले बैच में थे हमारे फर्स्ट बैच जो 98 में और सर मैं रविंद्र चौधरी सर को बताना चाहूंगा सर हमारे बैच के पहले बैच के जो बच्चे उसमें 70 परसेंट बच्चे ऐसे हैं जो विदेश के अंदर हैं और उसी बैच के बच्चे सर एक बच्चा हमारा अभी डिप्टी सेक्रेटरी है होम अफेयर्स में त्रिभुवन मिश्रा और एक स्टूडेंट जो हमारा है वो यूएन के अंदर एडवाइजर है जो वहां पर हिंदी भाषा का जो प्रयोग होता है सर यूएन के अंदर तो वो हिंदी भाषा का एडवाइजर है जो यूएन के सेक्रेटरी या डायरेक्टर हैं उनका तो ये विश्वविद्यालय के लिए हमने जो अचीव किया आज जो पूछते हैं पच्चीस साल में हमने जो अचीव किया ये सब अचीव किया हमने तो उसी सीरीज में हमने 25 साल पूरे होने के इस खुशी में विभिन्न कार्यक्रमों का आयोजन किया उसी में ही एक कड़ी है श्री नवीन अग्रवाल जी मेमोरियल लेक्चर सीरीज आज हम उस कड़ी का शुभारंभ करने जा रहे हैं तो सबसे पहले मैं सभी अतिथियों से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि जैसा कि हम जानते हैं किसी भी अच्छे कार्यक्रम को शुभारंभ करने के लिए भगवान का नाम लेना जरूरी है और ये तो विद्या का मंदिर है और विद्या के मंदिर में जो देवी विद्यमान होती है वो है मां सरस्वती मां सरस्वती के वंदन के साथ हम इस कार्यक्रम की शुरुआत करेंगे मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा आदरणीय चांसलर सर से वाइस चांसलर सर से प्रो वाइस चांसलर सर से और हमारे आज के अतिथि 
डॉक्टर रविंद्र कुमार जी से की दीप प्रज्वलित कर इस कार्यक्रम का शुभारंभ करें राशी सोच से सारी अपील कार्यक्रम की विधिवत शुरुआत हो चुकी है सरस्वती मां के वंदन से और सर हर यूनिवर्सिटी संस्थान के लिए उसका कुल गीत बहुत महत्वपूर्ण रखता है मान्य रखता है हमारे विश्वविद्यालय का भी एक कुल गीत जो हमारे ही छात्रों के द्वारा लिखा गया है और हमारे ही छात्रों के द्वारा गाया गया है जिस छात्र ने हमारे इस कुलगीत को गाया है सर मुंबई में वो सैमसंग में इंजीनियर है और पार्ट टाइम ही इज ए गुड सिंगर तो मैं चाहूंगा सभी से कि खड़े होकर कुलगीत को शुभारंभ करें मैं अपने आदरणीय अतिथि महोदय हमारे कुलाधिपति कुलपति एंड कुलपति महोदय से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कृपया डायस पर अपना स्थान लें अतिथि देवो भव की परंपरा को निभाते हुए मैं विश्वविद्यालय के कुलाधिपति से नम्र निवेदन करूंगा कि हमारे अतिथि को एक पुष्प गुच्छ भेंट कर उनका स्वागत करें धन्यवाद तो इसी प्रकार 1998 से जो जर्नी स्टार्ट की उसका प्रारंभ किया और कारवा दिन प्रतिदिन बढ़ता चला गया और आज हम दुनिया के उन विश्वविद्यालयों में शामिल हो चुके हैं नंबर वन यूनिवर्सिटी उत्तराखंड के अंदर मानी जाती है सर हमारे जो अतिथि हमारे बीच पधारे हैं मैं बताना चाहूंगा कि सर आज जितनी भी मल्टीनेशनल कंपनी हैं चाहे वो मेडिसिन इंडस्ट्री में हो चाहे आईटी इंडस्ट्री में हो चाहे इलेक्ट्रॉनिक इंडस्ट्री में हो अगर आप चाहते हैं कि वहां के वाइस प्रेसिडेंट से मिलना तो वो डीआईटी का स्टूडेंट ही होगा ठीक है डी वैल्यू नहीं ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्सिटी मेरे पास उन छात्रों तक का डेटा है जो आज की डेट में बड़े बड़े मंत्रालयों में बैठे हुए हैं और जिनका हमें मालूम नहीं लेकिन वो एक ऐसी पोजीशन पर बैठे हैं कि देश की आधी जो कार्य प्रणाली है वो डीआईटी के छात्र संभाल रहे हैं तो इसी कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाते हुए मैं हमारे ऑनरेबल चांसलर सर से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि वो अपना प्रेजिडेंशियल एड्रेस दें आदरणीय चांसलर सर 
Very good afternoon to everyone. Distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. G. Ravindra Kumar of the prestigious TIFR, Vice Chancellor Professor Raghurama, Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Priyadarshan Patra, Deans, Directors, Professors, Academics, and my dear students. This is the first lecture in what is supposed to be the Sri Naveen Agarwalji Memorial Lecture Series, which is basically in memory of late Sri Naveen Agarwalji. I have had the opportunity to interact with Sri Naveen Agarwalji when the state was formed and I was part of the administration in the secretariat in the state. And I had the opportunity to interact with Sri Naveen Agarwalji then. And one could clearly envisage at that time uh, the IMS institution was on the Cant Road where today you have the Centrio Mall. And that's where the IMS institution was. And this uh, DIT also was a fledgling institution as you know, Dr. Naveen Singhalji has mentioned. It had started 180 students. But what uh, I could get from discussion with him was that he wanted these institutions to become temples of modern India. He always believed in one thing that education uplifts the quality of human life. So education liberates an individual. Education adds gloss to personality. I think now that we are 25 years plus in this institution, to carry forward his memory, I think, is a signal and good contribution from the institution. The message that he gave that education uplifts the quality of human life is what each one of you needs to look at that when you get educated in this institution, go forward into the wide world with a lot of confidence. Imagine, aspire, achieve. That's the credo. So it's been written with a lot of thought, simple words but powerful meaning. The topic for today, Intense Light, a Tale of Two Nobel Prizes. I think intense light is something which a lot of light will be brought to the fore by Professor D. Ravindra Kumar. But there is a lot of, uh, I would think, applications that emerged out of these two Nobel Prizes, separated by a few years or so, that can actually revolutionize the quality of human lives. We have seen how laser and its uh, very many usages have revolutionized biomedical engineering. So biomedical engineering has helped enhance the quality of human life and also enhance the longevity of human life. And ultimately, everyone aspires to be immortal, but the immortality is a little difficult to attain at this point in time. I am sure that all of you will have questions to ask of Professor Avindra Kumar what immortality means and how science and technology will help us achieve that. With these few words, I welcome the distinguished speaker and I do hope that you must ask searching questions because that is where it will enable the speaker to interact with you more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your nice words. Now I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor G. Raghuram, sir, for his address. 
not give any address as such, but let me take this opportunity to formally welcome you all to this important event today. Uh, respected uh, Chancellor Sir, Ravishankar Ji, distinguished speaker and the guest, Dr. Ravinder Kumar, Professor Patra, my colleagues, dear friends, students. Of course, today we remember our founder. Whatever we are here as an institute, uh, the first brick was laid and the thought process in front of him. Uh, what was there, our Chancellor also mentioned. About a year back, I was talking to I talking to Chairman Anuj Jagarwalji, and I just broached this subject that we possibly can think of a lecture series, and then immediately he said, "Please go ahead." Then I had a following follow-up discussions with the Rav Shankarji, and then the board also approved it, and I am happy that today uh, we have launch we are launching this lecture series. Every year, there will be a distinguished speaker to come and address as a part of this lecture series. I was talking to some of my colleagues who should be the first speaker, and so happens when I was talking to our uh, professor, uh, Devishish Chaudhary. Professor Devishish Chaudhary, many of you students may not know, he's a professor of Dean of Research and Consultancy, has a long career in IIT Kanpur, he's with us as a professor now. Uh, we were just looking at some names and the uh, name of Dr. Ravinder Kumar came up. Uh, and uh, then he said, he is the best person to give the first talk. Who else? So after that, we didn't look at any other name and then followed up. And thank you, Dr. Ravinder Kumar. And he immediately responded as I wrote to him and said, it will be my pleasure to be part of this event. Thank you very much for taking your time out and then uh, here to address the gathering on a fascinating subject. I strongly urge all the students, this is not, it is a highly technical subject, but Dr. Ravi is one person who can make things understood by people at all levels. I think there are not many teachers and speakers have that ability. So don't get carried away by the subject, it could be very, very technical, I'll go to sleep, no. And as uh, Chancellor Sir also said, ask questions. Because at the end of it, some more light thrown into your knowledge and you expand your horizon of knowledge. That would have served the purpose. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you, sir. Now I will invite uh, our Dean Research and Consultancy, Dr. Devashis Chaudhary, for introducing about the speaker, Dr. Chaudhary. Honorable Chancellor Sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, and other academic leaders of DIT University, distinguished guests, members of the faculty and staff of DIT University, students, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's a great privilege to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Professor G. Ravindra Kumar, particularly because also he has been a friend of mine for the last 40 years, since the days we were students at IIT Kanpur. I thank Ravi once again for accepting our invitation. Professor Ravindra Kumar obtained his MSc Honours in Physics and BE Honours in Mechanical Engineering from Bits Pilani and a PhD in Physics from IIT Kanpur. He did a postdoctoral stint for one year at IIT Kanpur before joining TIFR Mumbai in 1992 where he is presently a distinguished professor in the Department of Nuclear and Atomic Physics. From the long list of awards, honors and recognitions that he has received, I would like to mention at least a few. He received the Shantishwadu Bhatnagar Prize, which is the highest award for Indian scientists under the age of 45 years. He also received the Infosys Prize, which at present is the most prestigious award in India that is open to citizens of all countries. And the list of past recipients includes Nobel laureates, field medalists, fellows of the Royal Society of London, 
elected members of the National Academy of Sciences USA, and so on. Professor Ravindra Kumar is an elected fellow of all the three National Science Academies in India and has been a recipient of the J.C. Bose Fellowship of the Department of Science and Technology of the Government of India, all of which are among the highest recognitions in India for outstanding research achievements. Ravi is a distinguished alumnus of Bits Pilani and IIT Kanpur. On behalf of DIT University, I now invite Professor Ravindra Kumar to deliver the first lecture in the series, Sri Lake Navin Agarwalji Memorial Lecture Series, which is in memory of the late founder of DIT University. Uh, thank you, the, sir. और अब इंतजार की गड़ियाँ बिल्कुल खत्म और हमारे बीच आज के हमारे स्पीकर डॉक्टर रविंद्र कुमार जी हमारे साथ होंगे आदरणीय रविंद्र कुमार जी so much for having me here and uh, you know it's a pleasure to be in the presence of the chancellor <coughs> vice chancellor deans uh, faculty students and uh, this i would have been standing here today but for two people one is devashish professor chaudhary as you all know and professor raghurama who they sent a mail and then they made the connection that was too strong to it was uh, Bits Pilani, IIT Kanpur, and these are little combinations, right? <laughs> so you can't resist when somebody from IIT cases, and he's a mentor, a very distinguished scientist whom I have respected for a long time. And when a word comes from him, you just follow. So thank you all for having me here and for having persisted uh, with your invitation. And it's indeed an honor to be uh, giving the first of this memorial lecture series. I read a little, little about uh, Professor, sorry, uh, about late Naveen, uh, Shri Naveen Agarwal. I think in this country we need more such people who have the vision to push education as a basic value in society. We have a lot of people doing things for their own self-interest, commercial, or whatever that is. But there are very few people who actually can do something for the society and it's, it's a tribute uh, to his vision that you know, you're standing in a wonderful University and from the morning I've been looking in awe at everything that's going around. Lovely buildings, very nice people, and wonderful weather. So it looks like you arranged everything for me. Thank you. <laughs> so um, today, uh, can we have this light so? Uh, is it clear to everyone at the back? Yeah. So this is. So I had a choice of topics. I had said something else, and Devashish said. Look, can you make something that um, you know really excites people, inspires the students of DIT? So then we came up with this title, or I just thought of this title, saying, I will summarize what happened in the last uh, seven years, say, or five years, um, which was which culminated in two Nobel Prizes for essentially related things, right? And I'll show you the relation of how these two Nobel Prizes are related and how basic science, as I was saying this morning to the physics students in the lecture room, should be done by as many people as possible. So basic science is the, the feet, the legs on which we have to stand to develop any technology. And I will indicate some of the technologies that come from absolutely fundamental discoveries. Right? And without these discoveries, there is no technology. So let me begin. And I come from this place. I hope it is charming enough. You are all hill people, but we are the sea ones. You know, like we have lovely shores. So from the hills you climb down, come down from your high station and come down to Bombay and see us at the end of uh, South Bombay where we are just next to the sea. So that's Arabian Sea and you can see the coastline of Bombay there. And we are a fundamental research place so we can ask any questions like why is the sky blue? 
what are the stars doing right now and why do the stars behave the way they do why do humans behave the day, the way they do what happens in how is life sustained how is it created etc etc so fundamental questions and hopefully a uh, couple of them will be answered uh, today so uh, let's begin very very simply i don't know what optics courses you have at dit or in general in undergraduate education so i'm just going to tell you most of us know this about light that you know everything that you see normally on a day to day uh, basis happens because of the fact that there's an atom with an electron usually somewhere far out from the nucleus light comes in with some characteristics a frequency wave vector electric field jiggles the electron a little and then the jiggled electron then radiates out the energy in the form of a, either the same frequency or a different frequency with a different amplitude same amplitude etc so this is what we go through most of us can go through life with nothing more than this right and as all beautiful paradigms in physics one of the most beautiful paradigms is the simple pendulum or the simple harmonic oscillator what you do you take the pendulum bob and shake it just a little from its mean position and you watch how it oscillates and this is why it's called a simple pendulum real pendulums need not be so simple but when the amplitude is very very small it's actually harmonic motion and we model it beautifully and this is the same model that is you know the simple pendulum model is so powerful it's used in every branch of physics almost and um, so you have a nucleus which is heavy which holds the electron and the interaction between them is a coulomb interaction that we know so well so light comes and now perturbs this electron and then the motion happens and the ray radiation happens so that's a spring mass model of optics so where does this happen so i have a thermometer here it's not actually a thermometer it, i call it an intensity meter and i'll show you how we will progress up this scale as we move on in the lecture so these things happen what happens in normal day to day life at something like 1 watt per centimeter square if you go out in the sun and compute how much of light sunlight is falling on your on the skin and you take it about centimeter square or so then you'll find that this is of this order or a less than this so beautiful things in uttarakhand dehradun i'm sure you see beautiful rainbows right i once did a trek and i had the most amazing experience of a semi circular rainbow in the hills of uttarakhand and i can never forget that so this is as we know a rainbow dispersion of light etc then we also are very fond of it how many of you have not looked at the mirror this morning in fact with the cameras these days everyone is taking selfie how am i looking now shall i upload this or not right so we do this reflection all the time in mirrors it's time we reflected on our own lives more often uh, and photoelectric effect something that everybody learns in school is that you have this photon which comes and there's a ground state electron in the ground state then there's an excited state and you have energy of the photon which is larger than this that knocks out the electron and takes it out so this is i give you all these examples just to tell you that each of this will be modified as we move through the lecture so just remember this dispersion photoelectric effect where you just knock out an electron by an appropriate energy photon 1960 was a revolution in many ways uh for various reasons from my point of view and well for most of us uh the laser was born on this in this year and that changed everything you know that laser light is very bright very coherent and very very powerful because of its concentration of energy in a small area so it just looks actually you can't look at a laser light for too long even if it's shining on a wall because it just sort of dazzles your eye so that's really the power of the laser and um so i'd like to begin by saying the one thing that lasers enabled was to increase the power that you can have in a light pulse or a light beam so i titled it very provocatively because so many other things in life are power games right if i replace optics with politics you all agree right given what's also going on right now so we are always pushing the limits of everything we want more power in everything we do and so let's see what happens if you push the limits of light power to higher levels how do you push the light power or the intensity of light um, all of you have done this how many of you have not focused sunlight in your school how many of you have not focused sunlight on a piece of paper in school any hands 
So all of you have done this experiment. The first thing you do is you catch the sunlight. Somebody gives you a lens and say, oh wow, this is very nice. Let me see what it does to the sunlight. And the sunlight gets focused, you put a piece of paper there, it starts burning, right? So intuitively you know that you have to concentrate light in a small region of space. And we think that's it. Now, so the reason is that if you take the same power, put it in a smaller area, like for example, I have seen one watt per centimeter square, can become 100 times larger if you just make the area to something like, you know, millimeter square or so. So now, um, I will say, let's increase it even more. I'm not happy with just focusing light that you give me. I want to make it even more powerful. So I want to tell you that when you focus light in space, imagine that as spatial confinement. Right? You're actually reducing the size of the beam to a very small value. And then that actually starts becoming uh, more and more intense. Now I say imagine the same thing in time, because as far as I'm concerned, space and time are equivalent you know, for my kind of experiments. What I can do in space, I can also do it in time. So now I say just squeeze it in time. You're squeezing it in space, now squeeze it in time. So how do you squeeze it in time? You actually make it a pulse. Right? So this is what I call a pulse of light. And if you take a humble one joule in one second, that's the unit of power, that's what we call one watt. But now take the same one joule and then emit it as a burst of a nanosecond, which is a billionth of a second. So instantly, your power is now a gigawatt, a billion watt. It is not average power. It is just the peak power. For the time that this thing falls on something, the effective power that it exerts on matter is actually one gigawatt. All you have done is to crunch the pulse in time. How do you crunch it in time? I will I'll show you very shortly. So if you can do both of them, then of course you can increase the intensities more and more. And when you increase, this picture will not remain the same. I wrote to you, uh, I pointed, do you have a pointer here somewhere? Do you have a pointer? Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm sure I can come here and talk about it because I have a mobile mic. So, this is the linear term, which is a simple harmonic motion. When the light becomes powerful, you actually have to use the E square and E cube. This is what is called a perturbation expansion in physics. Don't bother too much. But now the intensity is more. The square root of intensity is the electric field. So, the electric field becomes larger. And this is, imagine an electric field a large electric field which is now shaking this electron more vigorously than before. So it's no more the simple pendulum that you have. Now the electron starts leaking wildly away from its main position. And this becomes, this is what is called the basis for what is called nonlinear optics. Nonlinear optics because it's the power of E, E square, E cube, E power 4 and so on and so forth. So the behavior becomes essentially nonlinear. What does nonlinear optics do? So nonlinear optics has terms which are the squares of the electric field. So you take two electric fields like that and you have, you see what happens, basic maths, right, multiply two cos factors and you generate a sum frequency and a difference frequency. You take two laser beams at E1 and E2 and then shine them on some medium and then you'll get, apart from E1 and E2, the omega 1 and omega 2 will still be there. In addition, you get two more frequencies, which are omega 1 minus omega 2 and omega 1 plus omega 2. So you have produced new frequencies just by nonlinear interaction. That tells you that when the behavior goes from linear to nonlinear, new kind of phenomena emerge. And one of the new kinds of phenomena that emerges, and this happens when the intensity starts rising. For example, let me take, this is about from one watt, you jump a million times up, you go to a million watts per centimeter square or so, and then you put two red beams, right? You put two red beams, and what comes out is a blue beam, which is a two omega, right? And you see this in, not just in optics, you see this in electronics, where you produce harmonics of signals that are at very high power, and electrical engineers know this very, very well. So this is 10 to the six watts per centimeter square, and we have just heated up things a little more, and this thing happens beautifully. You can generate more and more laser beams. The two omega is actually a laser beam. It's not just random emission. It is a directed emission which comes in a particular, uh, along a particular K vector, and its intensity is controlled by the intensities of the two omegas that are actually going in. Now, it's still a power game, and I'm not happy, because I'm a minister now. I want to become the chief minister. 
I want to become the Prime Minister, so on and so forth, right? So there's no limit to our appetite. So I want to push it even higher. So how do I push it? I've given you the recipe, shrink it even more. In space, you can shrink it up to what is called the diffraction limit, which is on the order of wavelength or so. But as it turns out in time, you can do a remarkably much, much more effective job, right? So one joule in one nanosecond was one billion watt, one gigawatt. Now I shrink it to a picosecond. So I become a terawatt, right? So terawatt, I shrink it even more. I become tens of terawatt, hundreds of terawatt, and so on and so forth. So it's very easy to just squeeze the thing in time, squeeze the light pulse in time, or effectively confine the light emission to a small fraction of a second. And the smaller it is, the more the peak power. And so we have done this remarkably over the years as laser technology progressed and this leads us to what is called extreme light right extreme uh, in so many ways if i ask you what is extreme light you will say depending on your mood or from where you are coming you will define extremes in various ways right and so my definition of an extreme i will tell you what is shortly but uh, this question can be asked what is extreme so, for us, extreme is extreme behavior means that is some behavior that is totally unacceptable. But even extreme nicety is also something most of us may not be able to stand, right? So it can be very, very good behavior is okay. Very bad behavior is obviously not okay. But so it can be pushed. For example, you can raise something to a very high temperature, billions of Kelvin, billions of Kelvin. That's one extreme. You can also take it down to a nano Kelvin which is 10 to the minus 9 Kelvin, 1 billionth of a Kelvin, that's also an extreme. It's an extreme that is not usually found in our day-to-day -day lives, in typical labs, in whatever situations we normally face. So, small or big, or maybe small and big, we will see. So, I'm drawing your, telling you, you know, as I was driving uh, up the hills, I had various caution notices, maintain speed limits and so on. So I thought I'll just put, so extremely small numbers are coming your way, right? So just watch out for what these are, right? Light pulses can be incredibly short. How short, you can't imagine. I'll provide you a scale to measure, to imagine these numbers. Uh, in fact, these are the shortest pulses made in any context. There are no acoustic pulses, these are this short. There are no electrical pulses which are this short. It's only light pulses which can be shrunk to a level of what is called attosecond. Today, we have in the lab pulses which are a few tens of attoseconds. And attosecond is a billionth of a billionth of a second. Right? So, how did people do this? It's remarkable how we have actually come all this way in the last 30-40 uh, years or so. So I just want to point out to you from milli, which is boring, micro, nano, everybody is nano these days, right? I went to a nanotech lab here. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. And this is nano nano, if you really want to imagine. <laughs> so nano nano is 10 to the minus 18. And I have deliberately hidden something on the right hand side. So you ask me what was hidden there? You know, you have to open the curtain there. Parda hata do and then the kaoki wahapar kya tha. So um, before that, I want to tell you a little bit about pulses, right? I don't know how many of you can uh, look at the title and maybe understand where I'm coming from. A very famous physicist wrote a book called Brief History of Time. I twisted that to say History of Brief Time because I'm talking about extremely small pulses. So all light pulses, all pulses in general, in any context, have to obey this relation which is called the Fourier law, the Fourier relation, which is that if you want to have a certain pulse, you have to pay a price for it in terms of the bandwidth that you have. If you have a very short pulse that demands, that necessarily demands a very large bandwidth, or if you have a large bandwidth, you can hope to make a very, very short pulse. And that's an uncertainty relation greater than or equal to K. And it has various values depending on what, uh, you know, the kind of pulses that you have. Now imagine, the first thing, read the bottom line. The bottom line says, a pulse has a number of colors. It doesn't have one frequency. 
it has lots and lots and lots of frequencies. The shorter the pulse, the more the frequencies in it. So, I'll show you how it blooms. Actually, try to shrink it in one direction. It actually blooms in the Fourier space. Right? So, you notice here, the 10 picosecond is the blue pulse. And the 10 picosecond has a very, very small bandwidth. This is time. This is bandwidth here in terms of nanometers. So, this is blue here. is matched by blue here. Now, the shortest pulse, which is 50 femtoseconds, is very short in time here. But look at how it blooms in the spectrum. So, it just blooms. You shrink it in one way, and this is typical of, even in space, if you put light, uh, you light to an aperture which is very small, the light just diffracts after that to a tremendously, you know, large diameter, right? We have all seen the rings, the diffraction rings in our undergraduate lab. So, some first year students should pipe up and say, hey, but you told me lasers are monochromatic. So, what's wrong here? This is a laser, but it's not monochromatic. If it's a monochromatic laser, it cannot be a pulse, right? Pulses necessarily have to have large, large bandwidth. So, how do you get so many frequencies? You get frequencies by, in the laser cavity itself, the laser cavity is actually a box. All of you have done some physics, you have done particle in a box and so on. So, the energy spectrum gets quantized, right? The energy levels get quantized and so on. So, it's the same situation here. You have a cavity with a length L. And these are all the allowed frequencies of the cavity. So the frequencies are not continuous at all in the cavity. They are actually discrete frequencies which are allowed. And these frequencies are there. They, are, they can span the entire spectrum. It is just that not all of them may be operative in a particular laser. But you have lots and lots of frequencies. And the beauty is you see the spacing between them. It's exactly given by C by 2L, where C is the speed of light and L is the length of the cavity. So, if you have a large cavity, you have a very small spacing, you have a small cavity, you have a large spacing between the modes. These are called the modes of the cavity. And so, if you have, if you now put an active medium in that empty cavity and you start pumping it, you can amplify as many frequencies of source possible given by your medium and then you can have all those modes uh, oscillating in your laser. So, I am giving you now uh, a recipe for making ultra short pulses, as, as short as you want. You take monochromatic waves at as many frequencies as possible, right? And you superpose them. But you have to superpose them carefully. You have to superpose them in phase, right? In phase is the most crucial word that you have to remember. The phrase that you have to superpose them in, in phase, which is what is called coherent addition. Let me demonstrate that to you in a short while. So, firstly, Look at this top, I don't know if people at the back can see this or not. You have lots of waves which on the central red line is running through the peaks of each of these waves and they are all in phase, right? They are all in phase and you add them like this and you produce a very short pulse which is shown on the right hand side. But if you shift them even a little, you deface them or you shift them a little here and there, they fluctuate. For example, the centers here are certainly not matching. They are not matching at all, right? So, if you do that, what do you get on the right hand side? You get nothing, you get garbage. This is actually noise. So, more than anything else in ultra short pulse synthesis, what matters, you can have actually varying amplitudes, it doesn't matter. But if they are in phase, you will still get a pulse. But if you have lots of amplitude but no phases, you don't get a short pulse at all. You just get a continuous beam of light like what you're getting from uh, the lamps around here. So, look at this. So, this is what happens inside a laser. You have a pulse that is formed that goes out. So, it just goes back and forth. Every time it hits one of the mirrors, a little bit of it leaks out as a pulse. So, you have all these frequencies. It produces a train of pulses uh, separated by the round trip time, uh, you know, as it goes from one end to the other and back. And uh, a spectrum of a single, you know, pulse can be like this. But if you have lots and lots of them, then the spectrum itself gets modulated in that fashion as you can see. So now, what was earlier a solid line becomes a dotted line, which is just an imagination of how these frequencies are actually varying there. So let me go forward and show you my, don't remember these things, these things keep coming again and again. So what you have to do is in-phase addition 
or this is what is called locking of the phases. You have to lock people in phase, right? So if you are making a gut bandhan, right, in more ways than one, you have to think similarly. If you think one way and the guy, you know, I'm going this way, and you go the opposite way, where do we go? We go nowhere, we stay at the center. A plus here is cancelled by a minus here. So whatever gut bandhan you do of the modes, it has to last longer than what's happening in Bihar. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, and the femtosecond laser is the best gut bandhan that I knew uh, for a long time. Because imagine a million of those frequencies, discrete frequencies, a million of them are added in a femtosecond laser to produce a femtosecond laser pulse. And it's such a beautiful, there's one thing that you should realize about, uh, you should realize about in phase addition. If you take n waves and add them, you add the amplitudes of the waves. So you add E, 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 but when you square it, the intensity goes as N square. And this is what used in radio antennas and you know, communication and so on and so forth. So uh, add in phase, then you get an N square bonus, right? N people adding, N people working together in DIT will produce a super duper N square result. So please collaborate and work together. And uh, so, that was good enough for making femtosecond lasers for a long time, you know, last 20, 30 years. But then people said, how about going lower? And then that was that proved to be a massive challenge because suppose you take a 100 nanosecond pulse. So that is a duration of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And if you go by the Fourier relation, you need a bandwidth of something like 10 to the plus 16 hertz. And the visible light is 10 to the 14 hertz, 10 to the 14, a few times 10 to the 14 hertz. So this bandwidth itself is larger than the center frequency of the visible light. So people say, how do you generate this? I don't know, there are, there's no medium, there's no laser cavity that can sustain this kind of broad bandwidth. So again, we come to nonlinear optics. So I told you that nonlinear optics produces new frequencies. So we put two red beams and we got a blue beam out. Now I'm saying uh, that how about maybe we push the nonlinear optics a little more, higher and higher frequencies can be generated, and then we can put all of them. And the beauty is that the nonlinear optical process happens efficiently in certain media only when everything is in phase. The two beams that are going in have to be in phase, the omega soul that are going in, and the two omega that comes out will also be in phase with the omegas. So the phase factor is completely taken care of by automatic nonlinear optical effect. So Maybe I can shrink the pulse even more. So this is what you saw. Now imagine raising this by several levels of order, several orders of magnitude, right? For example, you're talking about multiple, imagine that there are n photons of omega, which are taking some system from ground state to n into h cross omega, and then from there it actually falls, giving you one photon of n times h cross omega. So n of each of h cross omega go take it up and then n times h cross omega comes out as a single photon. So um, this by the way I told you is actually coherent in phase emission, it's not actually a random light that's being emitted by a normal bulb. One omega can produce n omega, alright, but to produce n omega you need higher orders of the nonlinear uh, expression that I wrote, e square e cube will give you second and third. To produce n, you need the nth term to be equally strong. And for the nth terms to be strong, what you need is you need a lot and lot of power. The electric field has to go even more, larger and larger. And how do you raise the electrical power, anyone? How do I raise the electric field of my light wave? Shrink the pulse, right? So instead of taking a nanosecond pulse, I'll take a picosecond pulse, I'll take a femtosecond pulse and kick the system up to produce maybe 100 harmonic. Can I generate 100 harmonic? Maybe I can generate 100. And that will push me way up in the frequency ladder. And I can now put them together to get a short pulse, which is a nanoseconds. This is precisely what happened in 1987, right? This paper was published in 88. And one of the people who won the Nobel Prize last year, a lady, Anne Lillier, from Sweden, she was earlier at uh, at Sackley, uh, uh, at uh, yeah, she was in uh, Paris at that time in the uh, in one of the labs there. So she said, "Let me raise raise the intensity, and I will produce try and produce higher and higher harmonics." 
So she put this 10 to the 15 watt per centimeter square in a picosecond pulse and she produced the 21st harmonic of a 1 EV photon, 1.15 EV photon, which is actually 24 EV. So from visible light, you have actually go to the vacuum ultraviolet light. Right? This is not normally produced in the lab. Uh, and this is coherent emission. And under this, so for this to happen, she was using a very high intensity light. And so high intensity light actually ionizes the light, ionizes the electron in this fashion. So the light is actually a pulse which is going up and down. So the light pulse now modifies the electron potential and that distorted potential actually leaks out the electron from the distorted, uh, the, the barrier that's been distorted by the light itself. And then the electron now experiences reversal of motion and finally falls back to the atom and produces the, the harmonic pulse. So this is why how we understand. You take an electron from the ground state somewhere here, then you kick it up way up by, uh, you know, excited tremendously by multiple steps of the H cross omega that you have. And then it takes, it is taken far away from its core, wherever its core is. And then returns to the thing because light is driving things back and forth. And then when it falls down, it actually gives you the emission as a coherent emission, which is your harmonic pulse. So let me show you what happens. So this is how it actually happens here. That you have a distorted uh, barrier which is rocking back and forth every half cycle. And the electron is taken out somewhere on the single cycle pulse and then taken far away from there and then returned to the core to fall back and give the emission. So these people then came, another French guy uh, who was in, uh, uh, again at Sackley or Orsay at that time, Pierre Agostini, he showed that these pulses, these harmonics were actually pulses of 250 attoseconds. And then another person came from uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany who showed that this was again another few 600 attoseconds or so. And then we have finally the attosecond pulse that was generated in this high harmonic process. It was an accidental thing that, you know, that let's try and push the intensity further and further. You then produce an extremely uh, bright photon and that turns out that the entire light that you're producing is in the form of a pulse which is of the duration of a few hundred attoseconds. So we unveiled a billionth of a billionth of a second. Now all of you have been exposed to the delta function in your courses. How many people have not heard of the delta function? I'm sure not many. Uh, people would not have heard of this because it's every time we say let there be a delta function and we draw a spike like that, it occupies no space at all. It's just an infinite spike uh, with the x-axis almost of no width, no width at all. So this is by the way the delta function that we have in the lab now in time. Right? We really have a delta function in the lab and if you want to kick something with a delta function, you have to go to an attosecond uh, pulse uh, generated by high harmonics. And uh, so again something for making cocktail conversations or to boast with your friends. You can tell them, you don't know what is an attosecond? Oh, let me tell you. An attosecond <coughs> is here, it is one billionth of a second. right? A nanosecond is to a second, a heart beats typically at one second, right? That is the time. A nanosecond is to a second, as a second is to the age of the universe. The orders of magnitude are the same. This 10 to the minus 18 comes to 1 and the gate goes to the 10 to the 18. So this is a barrier breaking advance, meaning that we had, we thought that there was no way we could actually string the pulses more and more. And for such a barrier breaking advance, Right? <laughs> so, the Nobel Prize was given to Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Cross, and Anne Lulier. And uh, she's one of the few women who has actually uh, won the Nobel Prize in physics over the last hundred years. Accountably few, right? Now, there's one more woman who will come. And so the beauty is that 15 and 23, we have two women who have won the Nobel Prize. So I'm giving you advance warning. Wait for the thing. So, why do we need attosecond pulses? People are saying, kya fayda is it? You know, everybody says, oh, I tell them, I want worried about why the sky is blue, Usse kya fayda? So I don't know. But if I didn't know light scattering, I won't know anything about biology, right, today. 
I won't be able to make any scattering devices or anything else which, which are based on scattering. Um, so one thing that you can talk about at a second is the fastest camera that we have. You know, normally when we have a camera, we look at the shutter speed, right? And the shutter speed tells you what is the fastest event you can capture. So let me tell you, how fast does an electron move inside an atom? In the core, somewhere deep down there, how fast does it move? And the electron is actually moving. And one way of understanding, even if you say the Bohr model, is that the idea is that the electron is going round and round that nucleus, right? That, if you compute, is a nanosecond, a few hundred seconds or so. So if you want to really freeze that motion, catch the electron moving, you need a nanosecond pulse to go and look at where the electron is sitting and what it's doing there, right? So you need a nanosecond pulse for watching intra-atomic electron motion, and that was one of the first applications. In fact, photoelectric effect, you think that the electron just leaps out of the atom. Right? Light goes, falls, and the answer that any teacher will give you is, oh, the electron just comes out. No, no student asks, or is allowed to ask, how fast does it take the electron to come out? They say, oh, that's not a relevant question. <laughs> or sit down, please don't ask questions. <laughs> it is relevant to ask that question. It takes, there's a delay of some atom seconds before the electron jumps out of wherever it is sitting and exits into the continuum. It's a massive particle, it can't act instantaneously. So there must be some time that happens. And these experiments have just been done. And I'm sure in the next few years, uh, they will provide lots and lots of exciting understanding about this. So I call this actually atomic physics. So with an extra T. <laughs> so, and then people are fond of, can it make my cell phone go faster? Very relevant, right? Can I take pictures even faster? Can I do faster electronics? So people are actually talking about, uh, you know, making electrons, electron dynamics in solids, can they be made uh, like for devices and so on, if you understand them better, you can probe the dynamics better, and perhaps you can make faster electronics. Right now, we are at the whatever, petaflop, whatever the speed of computers that we have, so we want to go higher and higher, whichever way you do, if you can control the motion of electrons even faster, maybe you can switch them even faster. That's a dream right now, but I don't know how it will pan out. So there are lots of applications of atosecond physics. And now I'll take a small pause, and uh, this is a time for popcorn, right? So because, kahani mein twist hai, right? So the second half, the director decides to change, like what the eventual movie will be. So I want to talk about something big. I've had enough uh, time talking about something very small. So I want to talk about something very big when something else becomes small. You know what I'm hinting at, right? So for a long time after the laser was invented, the power of the lasers was stuck at one, 10 gigawatt, which is 10 to the 10 watt, or even maybe terawatt or that level, 10 to the 12. The reason was because they could not shrink the pulse to anything shorter than nanosecond. So you have the same nanosecond pulse, you need higher power, you need to increase the energy of the laser, right? The energy of the laser pulse. But um, if you, and then they made big lasers. These actually look like accelerators. They have a whole building, a whole DIT building, will just be needed only for the laser beam to come out, right? So many amplifier chains. And look at the human being there. He's just totally dwarfed by the laser pipes that are, and the, laser, the pipes are actually carrying the laser beam uh, through the vacuum. The problems, the big problem with nanosecond lasers, 10 to 100 million dollars, beam sizes of my height or half my height, I'm not so short. So maybe, you know, 30, 40, 50 centimeters. That is the kind of a beam. You want to know laser beams which are pointers, which are 1mm. Imagine a 50 centimeter laser beam. That's because the energy density is so large that you have to expand it to, so that you don't damage optics and other things. And uh, lots of other problems. So people said, oh, I want more power, so I need to go shorter. And I already told you that we can shrink pulses. So people said, oh, have a femtosecond pulse. Why not amplify it? So let me just amplify a femtosecond pulse. I have the denominator, which is very small. And now put more energy per pulse. And I boost the power. So as simple as that. Hmm. Sorry. Can't do that. <laughs> Why? Because the same nonlinearity, which was beautiful and praised to the skies in my earlier slides, becomes a big nuisance now. 
photoelectric effect recall one electron sitting there one photon kicking it up and then you know falling uh, the energy the rest of the energy coming out as kinetic energy of the electron and we you're all told in the whatever book you read that in photoelectric effect the intensity of light does not matter are you all told what matters is h nu not i right power is not in the eye of the beholder <laughs> it is in the eye of the laser beam so uh, if you have high power this is what happens one photon is not needed you give me enough power i can build a ladder of 10 12 13 15 photons and kick the electron up into the continuum no matter what you do an atom will be ionized if you have enough intensity so there are no neutral atoms in the focus of a laser pulse level at a very high intensity and this is what is called multi photon ionization so the photoelectric effect that you read was a normal photoelectric effect to be if you wish you can call it abnormal photoelectric effect or high intensity photoelectric effect so now it gets dramatically modified simply by the intensity of light so anything in the path of this laser beam will get ionized and damaged right so you cannot use you cannot directly amplify a femtosecond pulse so when you can't you know somebody has dug up some part of the road what do you do you take a diversion right or you think differently so let's understand pulses a little more i told you that the laser pulses have large bandwidth right for example a 5 femtosecond pulse at 800 nanometer which is a red color has a whopping 200 nanometer bandwidth that means if you have a 5 femtosecond pulse that goes from 700 nanometers to 900 nanometers so it's hardly monochromatic it has all colors in it from 700 to 900 and that's the only way it can be a 5 femtosecond pulse so they have lots of frequencies and recall what happened when i showed you the rainbow picture why was white light getting into multiple colors in the glass or in the atmosphere because of something called dispersion what is dispersion so dispersion is because each frequency has a diffractive index of its own and they all travel differently inside a medium right so if you have a pulse which is very short and you put it through a piece of glass simple humble glass right it actually sp spreads out it is no more a femtosecond pulse a 5 femtosecond pulse which you have done great efforts to create just put it through carelessly through a glass piece and that becomes something like in a few hundreds of femtoseconds or even a picosecond if the pulse is, if the glass is thick enough this is very bad because i wanted a 5 femtosecond pulse but and it has also something called um the frequencies across the pulse do not remain the same if you see this picture here this has low frequencies on the left hand side and higher frequencies on the right hand side so because the frequencies are traveling differentially inside the glass some of them stay back some of them go ahead so there are even frequencies separated out as they travel on so this is what is called a nice name chirping what things chirp according to you the birds right chirping is actually any frequency any sound that starts at one frequency and increases its frequency or decreases its frequency so these are two birds saying to chirp or not to chirp they have no option because birds have to chirp right so yahan se idea chalta hai take a femtosecond pulse stretch it in time right and when you stretch it in time the denominator goes up the femtosecond pulse has the bandwidth to be a femtosecond pulse right it's like amir khan and uh, was it dangal so he decided to broaden himself to suit the father's role and then shrinks himself to become the earlier avatar <laughs> whatever that was right when he was younger so you take a femtosecond pulse stretch it in time and the moment you stretch it in time or chirp it in time or chirp it you actually lower its peak power now this lower power pulse can be amplified right and once you amplify it there's no damage now because the power is very low and then you compress it back again and you know who gave this idea electrical engineers so the engineers among you please uh, take a bow 
because it's because of you that this idea came and then you have you have the power you have already the bandwidth so you can shrink it back and so you have now the power and the short duration without damaging anything and you have to be careful at the final stage but otherwise you're okay so this is what is called chirped pulse amplification or cpa right cpa is chirped pulse amplification take a short pulse which is what the bandwidth stretch it in what is called a dispersive delay line amplify it in an amplifier and then inverse chirp it to produce your femtosecond but high power uh, pulse back so that is now crossed and we are in a modern world where the right hand side will be revealed now a small makes big on the other side because now the duration is small the power has been increased with the larger amount of energy now you can go to what is called the petawatt of power which is 10 to the plus 15 exawatt is what is being planned 10 to the plus 18 so imagine at 10 to the 18 watts can't i can't imagine what it means to have some 10 to the 18 watts of power petawatt currently the world is actually at petawatt powers and this is how the revolution has happened for a long time we were stuck at gigawatt sub terawatt and something happens in the mid 80s right mid 80s there was a revolution using the cpa technology and now we are climbing on that higher path and going to larger and larger powers producing larger and larger intensities and these three people were awarded the nobel prize in physics in 2018 for so uh, for different aspects of light this person arthur ashton was awarded for making the light tweezer using light to tweeze molecules to tweeze things uh, to hold things using radiation uh, itself and these two this, this half of the nobel prize was given for chirp pulse amplification to Girard Muru and Donna Strickland, uh, another woman, one of the few who's got in the last hundred years. And uh, incidentally, this was for her PhD thesis work. So the people who have passed PhD, I don't give much hope. <laughs> people who are yet to do PhD, please you know, take the cue from her. And this is her thesis that she's holding. You know, it's very precious now. She doesn't want to let go of her thesis. So, and now she's a big professor. She's been working in Canada for a long time. This work was done at the University of Rochester. So this is extreme light in two ways, short pulse, high power. And that's the lab that we have at TIFR, where we have the 150 terawatt laser, produces 25 femtoseconds in uh, 3 point, and 3.75 joules of uh, energy. And uh, that's how it looks, they look beautiful. Uh, the green light is pumping the amplifiers and the orange glow is the tie sapphire crystal emission and the tie sapphire crystal is what is producing that 800 nanometer light that will be that's amplified in this laser so that is Gerard Muru at 2009 uh, in 2009 when he visited TIFR with our group and uh, what is the meaning of again you know you ask me okay I have this what does it mean now I have this power I crunch it into space now that I have a short pulse, I focus it, I produce monstrous intensities, what does it mean? Again, go back to the humble hydrogen atom. You take the 1s electron, the electric field there is 10 to the 9 volts because of the nuclear interaction. And that corresponds to 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter square. Today, in the lab, you can produce 10 to the 23 watts per centimeter square. And the students, what is 10 to the 23 in your chemistry books? Anything 10 to the 23? Avogadro number. So we have Avogadro intensity almost, right? 10 to the 23. And it is amazing that you can now beat the light exceeds the intramatter electric fields. So the nucleus tries to hold the electron with its own electric field. Light comes and tries to rip it out with its own electric field. Who is more powerful? Optics is all about power. So who is more powerful? So the electron nucleus gadbandhan is thodored by the light, right? In this fashion, the light takes out the electron from wherever it is, throws it out far into the space. But because it's an oscillating field, it just makes it keep jumping up and down. It's like a swing which has gone totally out of control. But the light is controlling it, driving it coherently, and it couples a huge amount of energy. And this is 
10 to the 20 watts per centimeter. The square, the story at 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter square. This is an atom in extreme light which obeys now the light more than anything else. And this is what we do at TIFR. We actually focus light uh, from a femtosecond pulse and in a very brief instant, we shatter the solid that is actually at the focus and we create a very high energy density plasma. And this plasma now is a, such an exotic species. It cannot be created by any other situation, right? This has uh, completely ionized atoms and you can now heat this plasma to such many of the electrons can be given. The electrons start from zero energy and reaches the speed of light all in a matter of 100 femtoseconds or so, 10 femtoseconds, 20 femtoseconds. And everything about this is actually abnormal. The largest magnetic fields on the Earth have been found in this plasma. The largest pressures, for example, when a light pulse comes and hits a target at this intensity, the light pressure that it has is something given by I by C, the intensity by C, that is 10 to the 9 atmospheres. This is one atmosphere. Imagine a billion atmospheres. So if you push and um, put a matter at billion atmospheres, what should happen? Squeeze it into, I don't know what. All sorts of phase transitions happen. All kinds of new kind of systems are emerging from this. New processes happen. And in fact, if you now heat up the plasma, uh, electrons get hot, they transfer energy to the ions, and the ions then collide. And when ions collide, the nucleus collide, uh, you can have fusion. Right? So fusion also happens. So lots of interesting things happen. This is literally laboratory astrophysics or what I call Tare Zameen Par. Right? So Tare Zameen Par happens with this kind of a laser. And this is what we do at TIFR. I don't have time to go into the details. So look at all the particles that skew out. For example, you have a you have, uh, lot of excitations happening here. You have electrons coming out. You have ions coming out and you have gamma rays coming out, you have terahertz coming out from this plasma and people ask, what uses all this? Kya farak padta hai? All these are femtosecond pulses. So you can use this gamma rays to kill cancer probably. You can use the ions to kill cancer cells. You can use the electrons to look at, to do some lithography if you wish. You can do whatever you want, right? And so that's why I say that if you didn't understand what was going on, you have no way of putting any of these particles to use. So let me just show you one of the things that we are, uh, is working? Okay, maybe I'll skip this. I have some of our results here, uh, where we have actually shown um, that we can create literally stellar conditions in the lab. Uh, what happens inside the sun, what happens inside stars and so on and so forth. The turbulent magnetic fields. We've also produced the most efficient terahertz source uh, on a tabletop from a liquid and we have also tried to control the electrons, the very fast electron motion inside solids. In all these papers, if you have time, take a look. And we've also made accelerators of particles, including neutral particles, right? So we made very ha bright, hard X-ray pulse sources. All these are extremely useful for applications. So this is what I call a brief yet intense affair with light. Now you might modify, brief, hence, intense affair with light. And in modern, the young people realize, these days, everything is brief, right? The way things are going in our society, you attach, you detach, and so many things are happening in the social realm, I, they are not going to them. But this is a wonderful way of capturing what happens in this field. Our stars are a tabletop, and uh, I just want to tell you that so far we've been on the shores of Bombay, but about 10 years ago, we have moved in, inside, uh, you know, into the Deccan, where we have a new campus in Hyderabad, where by end of 2024 or beginning of 2025, we'll have a petawatt laser. So we move from 150 terawatt to a petawatt laser, and uh, that's the new lab that's coming up. And these are all the people who are contributing to this work over the years, young students like you. In fact, this morning I advertised for TIFR PhD program. The master student are bright BSCs. Please appear for the exam on December, in December first week, for entry to the PhD TIF, uh, TIFR PhD program. And then you can come and work with us. Um, so thank you, but before that, if you have time, I'll show you a short movie. But this is the formal end of the talk. 
So shall I just quickly take <laughs> So while you are thinking of questions, let me show you a movie. Okay. So please think of questions, Miller. That's our lab. I couldn't take you to the lab, so I brought the lab here. So that's an experimental chamber where we do our experiments. And you can see the laser beam is shining away, right? And it's not small. It's actually 8 centimeters across. So there's, I put a scale here. You can see it's actually 8 centimeters. And it looks very benign right now. It's just flashing gently, right? Because it's so big, even though it's, it's got the power, it's an expanded spatial scale. So the intensity there is very, very small. But now we do something else. So, can you hear? So somebody opens that shutter. Do you hear a sound? You hear some tuck 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 tuck? So what's happening there? A little more. Let me increase the volume here. Okay, so this is the plasma that we created. And the plasma is actually created in air. It's so hot, it just rushes out from that place. And what you hear is a shock wave that's being produced in air. It's like a supersonic jet which which breaks sound barrier and creates a massive sound. So this is a CPL laser produced plasma where all those wonderful things happen. And uh, so that's a good way to ultra fast time scales, ultra high intensity action, and thank you so much for all your attention. Please. Now, this is the time for question and answer session. And, sir, uh, Dharaji, my I hope there are questions. Please. Uh, good morning, sir. Hi. Where are you? Sir. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. So, uh, my name is Shreya. We met in the morning. Sure. So, uh, my first question is, so we've learned that if we want to make monochromatic waves, we've uh, learned to use a Fresnel biprism, but it produces monochromatic waves of different phases. So now, since you're talking about non-linear optics, and we want to create monochromatic waves in the same phase, do you use similar prisms, or do you use something else entirely while you're making lasers? Well, the question might need a little discussion, but I'll tell you how we produce our frequencies. These are actually, I told you, coming from a laser cavity. So the laser cavity is a wonderful source of lots of these frequencies, which are all equally phased. And the laser condition itself keeps them in phase. So it's not so difficult to use. But if you have a way of generating multiple monochromatic waves and bring them to me in phase, I'll, I'll be happy to use them to produce a pulse. But these things come directly from a laser. Yeah. So you had a question. Stop light. <laughs> okay. So, I know. So this is a totally different regime. In fact, that's a regime of what is called coherent excitation, where you have it's again to do with phase. So you have uh, transitions which are happening inside an atomic system, and the transitions kill each other, right? So this is what is known as electromagnetically, either they kill each other or enhance each other. So there is a regime called electromagnetically induced transparency. So in those systems, you can actually uh, store the light in the excitation. And then when you probe it again, you can actually let the pulse come out. I don't know where you have heard, but very interesting. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sorry, chopping phase, I don't exactly remember the term. Uh, the Pulse is, I guess, decreased, and then it is the amplitude is. The power is decreased because the pulse stretches in time. Yeah. 
So the power is decreased, then the amplitude of the wave is increased. Increased, yeah. And then it is again recompressed. Recompressed, yes. So what was the limitation which did not allow you to, I guess, increase the amplitude of the chirping wave? Of the, the basic, basic, basic frame per second pulse? Yes. That's because I told you that you start amplifying, very soon the power level is so large that it damages everything inside. So why does not the recompressed? The recompressed pulse, that's a very interesting question. The recompressed pulse happens at the final stage where everything is done in vacuum and the pulse is kept at a very large diameter because it's a frame per second pulse, right? The energy density is reduced on the optics, optical components that you have and everything goes in vacuum. In fact, at TIFR we have done experiments where we have launched a pulse from one end of the room, the end of the lab, into a room, into a long corridor like this, it creates lightning. It ionizes air and creates lightning. So, yeah, yeah, the worship Well, I, I, I think we love it. So, you began by saying that you have to take a focus light with a point of the paper that we have done. Sure. So, now this is high power laser, although it is false. So, I guess this voice is not possible to burn a drone, is that possible? Um, yeah, for. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting into some dangerous territory. <laughs> but it looks like all of us have burning desires of one kind or the other. <laughs> so, actually, um, what traditionally is done to bring down drones is by ablating them with a high amount of energy. For example, I know DRDO is looking for things where you launch huge amount of energy and just vaporize the stuff. But this does it has it can ionize. These things can ionize, but the damage is limited because of the small energy that you have, right? But if you have a sensitive electronic instrument on the drone, that can be disabled by this, right? Or if you have anything where you want an instant where everything is led by ionization. See, the two differences. There is a crucial difference between a long pulse with high energy to produce the same power and a short pulse with a lower energy to produce the same power. The short pulse always re releases things by ionization, by an atomic mechanism. The long pulse decides to heat up the system and burn. That, that's literally burning. Even though I call this a burning situation, it is much more localized than producing, a, uh, putting a huge amount of energy uh, on a target. So you can destabilize, you can desensitize electronics, and you can literally throw the system out, out, out of gear. So students think of more questions. Is it a staff who is making the artificial sun? Well, um, not this way. Uh, this is too small. Um, in the world, there's an, you know, all of you must have heard of laser fusion. But laser fusion, uh, there have been some significant breakthroughs recently after about 40, 50 years. But that still uses nanosecond lasers, which are these monstrous beams. In fact, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard this. But the laser fusion is being uh, pushed by what is called the National Ignition Facility in the US, which has 192 laser beams. 192 laser beams producing a total energy of 3 megajoules. 3 megajoules. I was talking about 1 joule or 2 joules, right? So 3 megajoules hitting a capsule. In fact, the funny thing about the laser beams are big, the fusion capsule is only about 1 millimeter. So all of them are focused simultaneously on this capsule and the capsule is blown, I mean it is actually compressed and heated at the same time uh, because of the deposition of energy and that is supposed to produce fusion. But that is still quite some time away. So there is another way of producing fusion which is artificial sun is by magnetic confinement of uh, fusion in a plasma tube, it is called uh, tokamak. But that is again some experiment that will be tested only by 2030, 2040, 2050. I don't know how many of us will be around to see that uh, actually happen. Yeah. Can we have any healthcare application of these under a controlled situation like doing some surgeries? Presently, already some yeah. so, Well, um, the Chancellor alluded to some of these, you know, applications of lasers themselves. Femper second laser eye surgery is very common. You can get your eye corrected for 
refractive errors and then just throw out your lenses. And you can also do uh, retinal detachment that is also attached by lasers. This has been happening for a long time. But femtosecond lasers have come in a big way. Here it was done with nanosecond lasers. Then surgeries, you know, of all types are done with, if you have something, you have, uh, suppose you have a stone, maybe I launch a laser pulse, and I just blow the thing right there, just through a fiber or something, and I blow the kidney stone or whatever right there. So the mind boggles to think of all the applications that you can have with this kind of process. Um, so first of all, like, it was a privilege to hear from the laser scientists of India. I'm really glad our university organized this lecture series. And it was really interesting to hear like what you have described. And to be very honest and to be very frank, it was one of the very simplified lectures that I have ever attended. So thank you for that. So uh, my first question is, so you mentioned that uh, we are currently at the uh, beta state, like 10 to the power 80. So let's take the example of... 10 to the 15, right? 50, okay. So we are currently at 10 to the power 50. So let's take the example of the hadron collider, where we are colliding the like, atoms. Atom. But instead of atoms, let's say we have one atom which is revolving. And instead of the other atom, what, we, what if we collide it with the laser of the power 10 into 50? Mm. 10 to the power 50. <laughs> so I always discover... You know, I've come to uh, interact with smart people wherever I go, wherever I go. So this is a very interesting place. So I'll just modify your thing. For example, a powerful laser interacting with an electron, which is also moving very fast, for example, let's say, that can produce what is called a quantum scattered photon, which is, you know, again, a bright thing in the UV. For example, you have a very powerful light. You remember the light source is actually one EV. These are all great photons. But if you have an electron which is moving very fast and there is light, lots of light, high intensity light is both and collides with that electron, it can actually produce coherent radiation in the X-rays. So from one light source at one EV, you are now producing a tunable radiation at, uh, in the X-ray vision or ultraviolet vision. And this is becoming extremely uh, you know, attractive right now for various applications in not just condensed matter physics, uh, biology, everywhere. Right? So you can produce, you can change the colors of light. In fact, uh, somebody was mentioning, you know, given the correct political scenario, somebody was called something last night about changing colors. Right? <laughs> or chameleon as it's called. In fact, there's a laser which is called chameleon. Right? Because it takes one, foot, one color beam and puts it in there and yes, Spray of you know color is coming out or coherent light, so they cannot be any more point to round than uh, the laser, you know, on a nonlinear field. So that is the best way of explaining. But that's a very interesting question. Hadron is colliding particles, proton, 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 anti-proton, like that. Uh, that's what happens in accelerators, not the LHC, but you know, has been happening for a long time. Now this happens when the particle energy is very large. In each of those particles is seven tera electron volt. That is 7 into 10 to the 12 E. I am taking 1 EV. 1 EV becoming MEV, GEV, like that. <laughs> so I am going the other way. Those guys are banging things and trying to see why do we bang things to see what's inside. Right? So we are trying to probe substructure of all these particles. And particle physics has had a long history of discovering new particles, Higgs boson and so on. But these two are different regimes. I come from a humble one EV photon, but this is what many such humble one EV photons can do, acting together, rather than one tera electron volt photon, uh, tera electron volt particle. Uh, okay, sir. Um, I'll get to my next question. It is more of a theoretical, hypothetical question. This one. So, in one of your slides, you mentioned like you shown that uh, we have an atom and we are passing a very high power laser through it and the electrons are jumping out, popping out. So what happens if we increase the power of the laser to the infinity and comparing this to the uh, how we broke the sound value by increasing the speed. So if we do this, if we apply the same principle to this, so can we break the hypothetical space value? This is a more of a hypothetical question, but I don't know what's the space barrier, but what I understand, we already broke one barrier, which is the electric field. 
which is holding the electron and the nucleus together, that is being broken badly. I mean, right? Now I have thousand times the electric field of uh, the well, lots of light now. <laughs> so thousand times the electric field of the uh, the Coulomb uh, the field at, which is there at the one electron, right? So we already broken through several barriers, and now. Let me also tell you there is one more barrier also that we have broken. I showed you that the electron is released from the atom and made to jump up and down. If you look at the energy that the electron gets, that energy starts approaching any millions of electron volt at something like 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square. And when uh, energy of a particle becomes comparable to the rest mass energy of the electron, which is half a million, that's what is called the relativistic barrier. So we have broken the relativistic barrier also. That is, in no other experiment you can take a body photon and take an electron which is bound and excite it to such a level that it starts moving at the speed of light. And we have seen them in the TIFR experiments where we take the electrons from almost zero energy all the way till C, a fraction of C. So this is the only interaction that happens like this. This is the exact opposite of what happens in charged particle collisions where you have to always come with a larger energy than uh, what you want to transfer. Uh, okay, so just last question. So what is your, like, this is very intense. <laughs> He's very intense. Uh, I take that as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what is your advice for the body researchers, like for the students, for my peers who are here? and who want to contribute something like uh, uh, a topic of immortality was discussed like uh, at the very beginning. <laughs> and, uh, so what is something we can contribute towards that like uh, actually not making people immortal but making ideas immortal, making things, making research that is immortal like for example theory of relativity. It will be... I, I think I am too small to comment on all these larger issues of life but I would just say one thing. I think the young people here should to pursue their passion, whatever it is. And I am hoping desperately that many of us do. The basic scientists, that lots of you will get into basic science and push the boundaries. Push the boundaries, break the barriers, and don't listen to other people telling you that you have to do AI, ML, um, what else? Management, engineering, software. Lots of people are doing it, but not enough people are doing science. So we need more people in science, we need to make progress on all fundamental issues and technologies will come as a result of whatever we do. So ideas are always immortal. We are mortal, but ideas, I mean Einstein's ideas survive, they'll survive for, you know, eternity, right, till a civilization exists. So similarly, I think we should just use whatever opportunities you have at DIT, do the best that you can. Attend classes, listen to people, learn from each other, and I'll bring a little bit <laughs> of uh, you know uh, pitch for you. I learn as much as possible while you're at DIT because this phase will never come. And I told you, phase is important in life, right? This phase of life and that phase of life. So this phase should lead to the next phase of life in a coherent manner. So propagate through DIT coherently and absorb as much as you can. <laughs> oh, we can give uh, the key, the mic from there. Very illuminating and elucidative lecture. I have would like to know more about practical applications in two areas. One is uh, fusion energy yeah. and the other is fiber optics. You were mentioning about small pulses, high power. So I was trying to look at it this way. Capture that power, store it and then use it. Mm -hmm. so, that is one sort of uh, okay. thing, idea that comes in. <coughs> the other is, today we are dealing with volumes of data. So we are already in perhaps 
exabytes of data. So where you mentioned about auto exactly. second yeah. and the exa. So the extremities are sort of captured in the mm -hmm. lecture. So I thought why not seek your inputs on this particular thing. The fiber optics is something that uh, today maybe 85% of uh, the cables are uh, ocean based. Ocean. ocean based. So, yeah. and if it's the Red Sea, then you have a problem. So, you see everything red there. So, how do we use the power of science to enhance technology to manage things for better, let's say, human yeah. So, the second one is probably I am warming up to that idea the about the fact about increasing data rates. So, you know, all of us, the femtosecond pulses have been used for a long time uh, to convey information because they have a bandwidth and they are like, you know, they are just moving through a fiber. They get stretched in a fiber, but that can be handled by low dispersion fibers and so on. Lots of work has happened. So, because the faster you can transmit information using short run, if a pulse uh, you know, if you have a long pulse, one pulse carries information, you have to wait till the pulse actually leaves the medium or leaves that space. So with shorter pulses, they occupy very little spatial uh, distance, so you can launch lots of these pulses. You can, or in other words, you can actually have a large bandwidth, you can code multiple pieces in different parts of the spectrum and you can transmit, and lots of it has been done. Now one way is that maybe if we can get, right now, attosecond pulses are laboratory curiosities. But maybe they'll become on a chip very soon. Somebody might make a device in the next decade or so or 20 years where everything gets confined to a very small area. So you can use attosecond bandwidth to launch uh, the pulses across this entire spectrum. That's one thing. And um, so that will increase the data rates like anything for all communication. But I don't know if there's any way of actually capturing this and using it for something else. Uh, I think. Right now, there are, in my opinion, no ideas uh, that actually exist there. But maybe, you know, you can never say no. Uh, so one thing I've learned to say is nothing is impossible. <laughs> so anything can be done. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ravindu, sir, Dhanyavad. Ek. बहुत ही अद्भुत एवं ज्ञानवर्धक व्याख्यान के लिए और हमारे छात्र मैं एक स्टैंडिंग ओवेशन तो बच्चों की तरफ से बंदा है ना सर के लिए जोरदार क्लैपिंग देखो क्या पता आपको कभी पीएफआईआर में जाने का मौका मिल जाए और सर मिले वहां पे हैं तो याद रखेंगे आप लोगों को जैसे आप बोलेंगे मैं आई एम फ्रॉम डीआईटी यूनिवर्सिटी थैंक यू मैं अब कार्यक्रम हमारा अंतिम क्षण की ओर है मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा हमारे आदरणीय वाइस चांसलर सर से कि हमारे जो अतिथि हैं उनको मोमेंटो देकर सम्मानित करें आदरणीय कुलपति सर धन्यवाद सर मैं हमारे प्रो वाइस चांसलर सर को आमंत्रित करूंगा मंच पर कि वोट ऑफ थैंक्स प्रस्तुत करें आदरणीय प्रोफेसर प्रियदर्शन पात्रा जी डिस्टिंग्विस्ट गैस Chancellor Ravi Sankarji, Chief Guest Professor Ravi Kumar, Vice Chancellor Professor Rama, faculty, students, and friends. 
It is with a great sense of anticipation that we have gathered today for the momentous occasion, which is to launch the late Sri Naveen Agrawalji Memorial Lecture Series. As the convener of this event and the Pro Vice Chancellor, it is my proud privilege to extend a very uh, warm vote of thanks to all of you. Uh, we are privileged to have, a, as our inaugural speaker, the distinguished Dr. Ravindra Kumar, a, who is a leading and decorated experimental physicist. And each of you heard from him. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, I was uh, uh, absolutely excited uh, to hear that. Um, obviously, he took you on a thrilling exploration of how using bursts of intense laser light, we can recreate the ultra dense and ultra hot conditions that are uh, in the uh, available in the distant stars. Um, uh, surely I was excited and I connected what he said to two basic principles that I studied as a student, which is the principle of duality and the principle of reversibility. Let me tell you why, how, why. The duality, small and big. The hot and the cold. The little and the big. He, he beautifully explained uh, those relationships. Uh, that is a fundamental principle in all of science. Um, reversibility, that you have to think a little bit, what uh, came to my mind. Reversibility is how he explained to you a, a laser pulse when he is squeezing them in time. Uh, it is producing a number of frequencies so the Fourier expression or Fourier space, the bandwidth is expanding, right? And he also told you that that contains certain frequencies, discrete frequencies, that constitute the, the input pulse. Later on, he told you how you can take multiple frequencies of laser light combine them to produce the pulse that, you, that was spoken of. So that is a fundamental principle of, principle of reversibility that is in physics. Um, I was personally excited because I worked on reversibility in quantum computing. Uh, anyhow, um, my heartfelt gratitude goes to all the contributors, participants, supporters and well-wishers who have made this series a reality. Uh, this includes the esteemed guests, the invited media uh, representatives um, who uh, are present here, um, uh, the committee, there was a committee that was uh, made for, uh, you know, preparing for this. Uh, I, I am thankful to all the members of the committee who worked for last two, three weeks. Um, and uh, I, together, let us boldly embark on the intellectual odyssey, carrying the torch of knowledge, a love of learning, and an unwavering commitment to excellence that defined the life and legacy of Sri Naveen Agrawal. Uh, may this first lecture be the spark that ignites a thousand minds. Jai Hind. धन्यवाद सर और अब अंतिम छन कार्यक्रम का मैं सभी फैकल्टी और स्टाफ मेंबर जो यहाँ पर बैठे हुए हैं उन सबको चाय पर चर्चा के लिए वेदांता के रिसेप्शन पर इनवाइट करता हूँ और बिहाफ ऑफ डीआईटी यूनिवर्सिटी थैंक यू ऑल ऑफ यू